thank you for joining me today in my garden on a beautiful fall day in Norfolk, Massachusetts. It really is lovely. The temperature's in the 70s, and that's really rare for the end of October. I'm in my herb garden, where I usually start my program, and the herb garden is winding down, and we've got a lot of leaves and pine needles, and they're gonna stay. I have decided that my schedule of thoroughly cleaning my gardens, those days are over. In the first place, it's much better for the environment if I leave the leaves. That's where the little beneficial creatures live during the winter. Also, the chrysalises of butterflies and moths also are in the garden. So I leave the leaves until spring, and I don't do too much cutting back either because many of these little insects like the stems of spent flowers. I still have some things I can use out here. The annual herbs are gone. Basil was killed by frost several weeks ago, but we still have things like sage and thyme that can be picked, and I can pick those. And these uh, herbs that are can be used as insect and moth preventives, make little bouquets of those and put them in areas where you might have mice or other uh, insects that come in in the winter, moths and things like that. So those can be picked and used, but for the most part, my herb garden is finished for the year. So let's move on to the perennial garden. Here in the perennial garden, I'm also going to leave most of the leaves and stems standing. There are a few exceptions, and we'll get to those a little later. But it's also bulb planting time, and October is the ideal time to plant bulbs so that they have time to put down a few roots before they get to the real cold weather. And I'm down here. This is an area I cleared of, of some of the ground cover, and I decided I'd like to have some tulips in here next spring. So I'm digging down. And you want to plant tulips about at least three times as deep as the size of the bulb. So I'm down fairly deep. It also gave me an opportunity to get rid of the roots from the ground cover that I took up. And I have five Darwin hybrid tulip bulbs. And I'm going to, these are not too terribly large, but they should make a nice group. And instead of planting them six or eight inches apart, I put them in fairly close together. So I'll have a nice bunch. And I have five. Five in a bunch seems to be a, a good number. But deep planting is really the key here. And then I have some cayenne pepper. I'm gonna sprinkle a little bit of that in, which I hope will uh, deter anything squirrels or chipmunks that would like to dig these up and eat them. There are various strategies depending on the severity of your animal problems. We have a few rocks to move. I'll tamp this down well, and then I'm gonna sprinkle it with a little more of the cayenne pepper. This will help discourage someone from digging them up, I hope. This will be repeated with other bulbs around the garden. Obviously the crocus bulbs, which are only about this big, don't get planted quite as deep as the tulip and daffodil bulbs. Make a note that uh, crocuses and tulips are highly favored by deer as they come up in the spring. So you wanna make sure you come out and spray them or put uh, wire around them as they come up. Hyacinths and daffodils are more deer proof. I think deer will eat just about anything if they're hungry enough, but daffodils and hyacinths are a surer bet if you have a big deer problem. The other thing I need to do is do some spraying. Most of my summer spraying was on perennials 
and shrubs that the deer really liked, particularly hosta. At this point, I need to spray azaleas, and this is just a little pump sprayer. But azaleas and rhododendrons and hollies, because the deer will eat those. This one bush particularly is prone to deer damage, and so I want to keep that one sprayed about once a month throughout the winter. Now I'm going to move over to another area of the garden and do some other work that needs to be done. I've planted throughout the garden some uh, canna lilies and other summer blooming bulbs that are not hardy in our climate. So what I want to do is dig those bulbs once they've been blackened by frost. And some areas of my yard have been hit, other areas have not. But I'm just using a pitchfork to dig these up. Most of the ones I planted in here are not large bulbs or tubers, but uh, they will, they were hampered a bit in their blooming by the rain. And you'll notice there's a little soft spot on this one, which I will need to cut off before the bulb is stored. But I will be cutting these off at about an inch above the bulb, and these will be stored inside in, on top of a bed of peat moss in a cool room. A cool basement is ideal, 50 degrees is ideal. I can't have that kind of an environment in my house. My garage gets too cold and the inside is too warm, but an unheated or poorly heated bedroom is what I've been using and it seems to work so far. The other thing I'm doing is collecting my plant supports. Even though I don't cut down all the plants, I do collect the plant supports and store them away for the winter. We have a last rose. Again, I will not deadhead the roses anymore. I stopped doing that over a month ago. Let them form hips if they wish, or at least die off naturally. This tells them that winter is coming. They need to get ready. We'll have more on that next month of winterizing roses. Any new perennials that you've put in this year and been watering, continue to water until the ground freezes. They need to form good roots so that they'll come up next year. Now I'm going to move over to the other side of the garden. I have a new clematis on this uh, trellis, and I've put a rock in front of it uh, for a reason. Not only will it tell me where it is come spring when there's no foliage there, but it will warm up early and give the clematis a little extra heat as on the roots. It covers the root area out in front of the clematis, and I like to keep a rock in front of it, of each of them. It seems to help with the growth. One of the things I will cut back, this is an exception to the rule, is all the peony here and all the rest in the garden. They were damaged by some mildew, so I don't want to put them in the compost pile, but I will find a spot for them in the trash. And I'll cut that all the way back to the ground. It will come back up in the spring and bloom just fine. I'll cut this all the way back. It really doesn't take much time to clip these once you've removed the supports. And we can just round it up. And oh my, we have some weeds under here. So be sure to keep weeding. You'll save yourself some time next spring because each weed can produce thousands of seeds and they don't stop necessarily producing those seeds until the ground is frozen completely. So weeding is somewhat important throughout the fall. 
The other plant that I like to cut back would be the iris. This is a Siberian iris, and this takes a little more work. But I like to use the scissors and go right down to the base of the plant. And I'm doing this before it's turned brown. But I don't like working with them in the spring, which is one of the reasons. It won't hurt if you leave it. But you will need to do that in the spring. So all of the iris gets trimmed back. And I'll also probably pull the daylilies, which you see one right here. Once their foliage is browned, they're pretty easy just to pull out. But I do like to cut down this foliage. Other things I will leave. This has been a lovely aster. You can still see the remains of the blooms. Up until the last rain, it was a solid field of blue. And one of the favorites for butterflies, some butterflies are still around, not many, but those who are really enjoy it. And the bees have been crazy about it. They love the fall asters and the chrysanthemums too. This is a chrysanthemum that I cut back. If I hadn't cut it back, it would probably be about this tall, flopping all over the place. But if you cut them back, they will stay more compact. I have a heliotrope here. This is an annual plant, so that can be pulled, as well as any other annual plants. It helps to get them out of the garden. Now, moving down the way a little bit, I have some interesting seed pods, and we have Sedum Autumn Joy, which is in bloom now, as well as a, a pink lower sedum, a ground cover sedum. Those are some of the later fall blooms, as well as some ornamental grasses, and a few zinnias, which once they turn brown will be pulled. The Verbena bonariensis, which is a tall verbena, is actually an annual, but it's a reseeding annual which means the seeds that it spills now will come up in the spring. If you want to have this anyplace else, as it goes to seed, just clip off the blossoms and put them where you might like some to come up next year. The seeds are tiny, but you scatter them around and you should get a couple blooms from them. I've put up a what looks like a pumpkin but it's actually a zucchini. I grow round zucchini. And if you miss one and don't get it picked in time, it will turn orange. So I use them as pumpkins. Well, I usually let at least one grow, so I have a pumpkin for my post. I put up some Indian corn, but if you put up Indian corn, unless you treat it with some hot sauce or something similar, expect that it will be gone soon. The squirrels, the chipmunks, they all like Indian corn and they will You'll come out one day and you'll have just corn cobs in order to uh, be a decoration. So these are some extras I had. I put them out and I didn't treat them with anything. So I expect in a few days they'll be gone and then I can just get rid of the tops and the cobs. Now it's time to go into the vegetable garden. As you can see, the garden is a lot emptier than it was a little earlier. We have had a frost. It hasn't been a hard one. We've had several that were small frost, but my area here does get it fairly early. I have friends whose gardens haven't seen any frost at all. I have. But I've taken out peppers, tomatoes, squash, and left only the things that are going to be hardier. We have some arugula, and Swiss chard, perpetual spinach, some radishes and beets, and some of the lettuce that I planted in last month has come up, so I have a little bit of lettuce to pick. And I was surprised to find that the dill from earlier in the season has reseeded itself, so I have a nice new crop of dill. None of it will probably go to seed at this point because it's late in the season, but it still is nice to have some sprigs of dill to put on your fish or whatever you want to cook, or a little in salad. The calendulas have not suffered from the frost. In fact, they're blooming quite well. 
So they give me a few flowers, annual flowers. Again, once it freezes solid, they will be gone and join the compost. The zinnias are all gone and they are being pulled as they go. It's time to plant some garlic and I formed a row here. This is where I took out some strawberries so that I can replant strawberries next spring. You need to redo the bed about every five years. I left a few so that we'll get a few berries but we probably won't get many. Garlic looks like the garlic you get at the store but you want to make sure it's you use it from the store that it hasn't been treated with anything to prevent it from sprouting because sprouting is what you want it to do. I've dug a trench and before I dug the trench I mixed in some compost from my compost pile and each of these cloves is made of or heads is made up of little cloves and we're going to break those apart. The roots are on the bottom and I'm going to plant these about six inches apart in my trench Big ones, little ones, they will all grow. Garlic is an easy crop. Nothing much bothers it, and it doesn't require much except weeding, and of course a little water and maybe some fertilizer in the spring. And we're gonna poke these in, heads up. Depending on the season, if it's warm enough, these will come up in the fall. And uh, that doesn't matter. Things like grape hyacinths and oriental poppies also put up foliage in the fall. And that's fine. It doesn't hurt them one bit. They may lose it in the winter, but they'll come back up in the spring. And once these are all covered over, and I've planted them all, I will mulch them with some straw and I can dig this. I had some left from my mulching or I can dig it from other parts of the garden. And the straw is going to stay on right through next year through the winter. It just gives them a little extra mulch and it helps keep the weeds down. Yes, weeds can still grow. I'm still doing some weeding in this garden too. The fewer weeds you leave in the garden, the fewer you'll have next year. Again, we're picking some things. And I'm also doing things like picking up stakes. I had supports on my tomatoes. I have supports on the tomatillos. The tomatillos have only recently been frosted. And I was able to pick a goodly number of them. But it's now time to pull them out and remove them, the, the supports and put them away for the season. So the garden stakes will come out, as will all the supports, and the garden will be in a rest state. Still picking a few things. This is broccoli, and we have a nice head right here, and I'll just cut that off. We also have some small heads. And I also grow a, ro a broccoli relative on the other side of the garden called Pyrosacaba. And it makes little tiny heads, very much like these little pieces of broccoli that I'm picking right now. And these can be sauteed, put in stir fry. They're very good to have and they'll bloom and continue, not bloom, but they will continue to form these little heads probably into November. So I will not pull up the broccoli even though I've harvested the main head. I can look forward to getting quite a few more pieces. I also have some cabbage, a couple cabbages left to be picked, some carrots to dig, kale to be picked and processed. And these are some bitter greens that can be added to salads or sauteed. And there are also some parsnips on the other side of the garden and Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts actually become sweeter if they've had some frost. So those will stay, again, probably until about next month. And then we can pick those. As far as flowers go, the calendulas will see us through fall. 
They're cheerful and they will reseed throughout my garden. I did not plant them this year. They just reseeded and I like that about them. They're a low and cheerful flower that blooms all summer and into the fall. Well worth adding someplace in your garden. Now let's move over out to the backyard and see what's happening there. Leaves and pine needles. We have them in abundance because we have trees, which I love. And uh, we've learned over the years how to handle the leaves and pine needles. I used to clean up every area completely. I've just, I don't do that now. The leaves are a good mulch. And when you think about it, plants still grow in the forest and nobody sweeps the leaves up. They do become mulch over time and they are beneficial again to the wildlife and particularly the insects that are beneficial in this area. But there are some areas I do want to keep clear so I have a leaf blower. I have several leaf blowers to clear, keep some paths clear and also to keep my patio clear of leaves if we wish to use it. And I also use the pine needles. I do rake up the pine needles as much as possible. They can be pretty acidic but they make wonderful cover for paths. So we have a number of pine needle paths, one going back to the brook at the back of our property and several others throughout my flower gardens. So I will renew the pine needles as I rake them. None of the leaves or pine needles leave my property. They are either composted here or used for pine needle paths. Pine cones are used for fall decorations for the most part. So we leave the leaves here. I don't, none go off of the property, they stay. Uh, the leaf blower works well. We also use the lawnmower and mulch much of the leaf matter. Uh, sometimes it's too much to mulch into the lawn. But frequently, if you mow frequently, you can mulch many of the leaves into the lawn and they provide fertilizer for the grass. I've covered my pond because I don't want leaves in the pond. So I've covered it with netting and I'm holding it down with rocks around the edge and about once a week I flip it up and push the leaves out so that I can see the fish. Uh, I've left my waterfall in and filtration system going, especially on a day like today. The fish appreciate it and it helps clear the leaves. I've used the enzymes that help break down any matter that gets in and yes, some leaves do get into the pond. I have a lot of frogs, so I've left some spaces around the edge so the frogs can get in and out. And there's probably about six frogs in there right now, which you may or not may not see. You have to look pretty closely because they do have camouflage coloring. And they're hard to see sometimes, but it's fun to come out and count them periodically and see who's living in the pond. I've switched to a spring and fall fish food. Now today, they would have been fine with the regular food. But generally when the temperature goes down to the 50s and 40s, you want to use a food that's easier for them to digest. Once it gets below 40, I'll stop feeding them all together. I have noticed they're eating a lot less. But today, with it being warmer, they are hungry. So here they come to get some food. About the time I take out the waterfall and the filtration system and move it into the house, I will put in this unit which will keep a hole in the pond. This will prevent any gases from building up in the pond itself and killing the fish. So this will help the fish stay over the winter. Without it, if the pond freezes solid, and it does, uh, there would not be a hole and gases could build up from the fish waste particularly and uh, organic matter that's decomposing and that would be very detrimental to the fish, probably killing them. So we'll put the little heater in. It's thermostatically controlled, so if uh, there's no ice on the pond, it doesn't work. That helps with the electric bill. Any of my clay pots are emptied and come into my shed for the winter. Plastic pots can stay outdoors, and indeed I will fill some of my plastic pots that are around with uh, winter decorations. The uh, clay pots tend to fill with water and then they freeze and crack. So you want to get them 
inside or at least upside down if you can't move them inside so they don't collect water. Again, the clay pots can be stored wherever I store them outdoors because I don't have that much space for them. I've taken down most of my birdhouses and cleaned them out. I wear a mask even when it isn't COVID. I will wear a mask and gloves when I do that because you can get some illnesses from birds and I want to avoid that. It's also sometimes a little messy. You have to be careful that there aren't mice in the houses when you empty them or you'll get a little surprise along with the spent matter in the birdhouse. I try to take as many of them in as I can but some of them are mounted permanently. Those I try to clean out but don't always get to it. Again I used to be much more cleanly than when I cleared the garden and now I'm not as worried about it and I've enjoyed fall a lot more since I decided not to take every leaf off the ground. It's a beautiful day. Uh, there's a lot of beautiful color around. It's time almost to get out the bird feeders. I only feed in the winter so I'm getting them ready, putting things in my shed that need to be stored away and taking things out of the shed that would attract mice or other types of insects. Anything made of cloth or paper comes out of the shed for the winter. I also put in a mouse trap and some mouse preventive, um, a mint substance that helps discourage the mice, and some of the herbs from the herb garden that are, are very uh, potent in their odor, and that seems to help. We still get a few mice that come in. The building is not tight, and they find a nice cozy spot, and they like it too. We'll see you next month, uh, in the garden at least. We've had snow in the end, at the end of October. Based on a day like today, I don't think it's going to happen this year. But with the weather this year, who knows what might happen in the next month or so. So it's time to get ready for winter and get things squared away the way you want them. Bring in your firewood and be ready to spend a cozy winter inside. Let's go inside now and see what we can cook up for Halloween. Today in the kitchen we're going to make a few Halloween treats. I don't like the really scary ones, but these are a little bit scary. And I think this year Halloween's going to be a little different for people. Uh, Trick-or-treating is probably going to be a little more low-key if it happens at all. And house parties are definitely out of the question with the COVID virus still active in the area. So it's fun to kind of do something at home for the family, small, small amount of servings that you can make that's kind of special for a Halloween dinner. And then maybe watch a nice Halloween movie afterwards. Either The Great Pumpkin or, if the kids are older, one that's a little bit scarier. I've started out, I'm going to make a uh, shepherd's pie with ground beef. Often shepherd's pie uses leftover roast beef and vegetables and mashed potatoes, but today we're making it with ground beef. And I've started out by sauteing a chopped onion, chopped medium onion, and one clove of garlic, which has been minced in a tablespoon of olive oil. And I'm cooking those just until the onion becomes a little clear. Now I'm going to add the ground beef. And this is a pound of ground beef. And I'm going to break it up and brown it in the pan with the onion and garlic. Started good here. I'm 
And while the meat is browning, I will work on some mashed potatoes. I've already cooked four potatoes, and I chopped the potatoes in fairly small pieces, cooked them in water, and drained them. Uh, I've started out mashing them with my mixer, and I'm going to add a few things to them to season them. The first will be a quarter of a cup of sour cream. In the traditional uh, shepherd's pie, the mashed potatoes go on top. These will also go on top. And I also have four tablespoons of butter and a quarter cup of milk. And we'll use the mixer to combine those items. And then we'll add a quarter of a cup of shredded cheddar cheese. And that will be our, our topping. And then mix it in so it gets nice and melted. Our potatoes are finished. And we need to continue browning the beef. A little bit more. It's almost there. If there is a lot of extra fat in the pan, you can drain that off. This is a fairly lean beef. And while it continues to brown, I'm going to add some seasonings. I want to add some steak seasoning. I'm going to add a teaspoon of that, and this is an unsalted Mrs. Dash steak seasoning. We'll add two tablespoons of Worcestershire sauce, and this again is a low sodium one. We don't want to load up on too much sodium. A tablespoon of ketchup. We can mix that in with the beef as it's browning. It's starting to smell pretty good. I'm going to add two tablespoons of all-purpose flour and mix that around. This will thicken it and make our gravy, ultimately. A uh, bit of gravy in with the uh, meat. Let's stir that around. And three-quarters of a cup of beef broth. Well, this mixture needs to cook for about five minutes on simmer. To thicken it up, you definitely want to boil the flour a little bit so that it's uh, 
the thickening agent in this. While we're doing that, we can fill a pastry bag or a plastic bag, if you wish, with our mashed potatoes. If you were making this for a meal without it being Halloween and you didn't want to be this fancy, of course, you could just put them on top after the mixture was prepared. Adding them to the pastry bag. Which has just a large single hole in the bottom. You can probably see that. Or if you're using a plastic bag, you can just cut about a three quarter inch hole in the bottom of it. At this time, I'm going to add a cup of peas and carrots. Frozen peas and carrots is a fine thing to add. This gives you the vegetable aspect. And we'll just run that up. And then I'm going to put it in the casserole dish. What I have out. And then we're going to make some ghosts on top. The plan is to make about six of them. And basically, we just make piles of mashed potato. It'd be nice if they stand up, but they possibly will not. And we may be able to come back and make them a little larger. And we want the base of this one. There we have six would be ghosts on our ma of mashed potatoes, and then we need to put some eyes on them, and for that I'll get out and throw some peas. And we'll add a couple frozen peas to each one for eyes. Sprinkle another quarter cup of cheese around my ghosts on top of the meat mixture. And then this is going to go in a 375 degree oven for 20 minutes. And then it will be ready to serve. It'll make four to six servings depending on how hungry your resident ghosts are. Put that into the oven. Again, 375 for 20 minutes. Now we have some other things to make to go with our meal. And I'm trying to make an hors d'oeuvre that's also Halloween themed. And this will be some deviled egg skeletons. Actually, they look kind of like the guy with hockey mask in the horror movie, too, so you may call them that. But what I'm going to use is uh, 
eggs, just deviled eggs, uh, hard-boiled eggs. Best way to cook hard-boiled eggs is in, I have found at least, is in the uh, Instant Pot. Six eggs, one cup of water, and five minutes pressure cook setting, and you will have perfect deviled eggs every time. And they peel easily too. Now to get the pattern on the eggs, I'm using two drinking straws, one large and one small. And it helps if you kind of support the egg while you put the holes in for the eyes, nose, and mouth. And around the bottom as well. And sometimes these stay in the straw, sometimes they poke out. The idea is to have the holes in the egg. Uh, using your fingers underneath helps support them a bit. And there we have a, a face on the egg. And I'm going to fill that with the yolk mixture. Oops! And the yolk mixture for this one had some paprika, some mustard, some mayonnaise, the, the mashed yolks of course, and some finely chopped roasted peppers. You can use any recipe that you like for the deviled eggs. This gives them a little color on the plate. And I'm going to just kind of make sure it gets in there good so it kind of comes up through the holes a little bit. And then I'm going to, because we're serving them upside down, I'm going to dip them in mashed corn chips. Or you could use crackers or even breadcrumbs. And then we can put these on the plate. And I've used a plate of uh, arugula. You could also use a plate of corn chips and serve those with it as an hors d'oeuvre. And again, we'll do another one. The larger straw for the eyes. And then accept the nose and mouth with a smaller straw. At this point we can add the filling. And again put it in the corn chips. And use skeleton double eggs. Here's an order or side dish, whichever you prefer. Now I'd like to also do a dessert item, and what I've done is a quick dessert. This would be a fun one for maybe the kids to help with. I'll put this over here for now. And what I'm doing is making some ghosts out of donut holes. And these were pumpkin donuts. And what I've done is use powdered sugar coated donuts. And if they've lost their coating, you can shake them again in a plastic bag with some confection of sugar. And then I've used a lollipop stick. And a piece of tulle netting. Uh, any type of net would do, but tulle or cheesecloth would work just fine. This is, happens to be tulle that I had on hand. I'm going to wrap it around and then put a ribbon around and tie it to finish it off. Now, in order to put some facial features on this, use my scissors to kind of crimp the ribbon. This is the crimping ribbon. You could tie a ball if you wish, but you were uh, have that type of ribbon. We'll crimp it, but we need to put a face on the sky. And there are several ways to do it. Obviously you don't want to glue anything on because then, then it wouldn't be edible. Uh, so you can use frosting to add uh, construction paper dots that would stick to the netting and not be edible. Or I happen to have some chocolate. 
And I'm going to use some of that to make some eyes. It's melted. Just a few chocolate chips will do. Melt them in the microwave for maybe a minute or so on defrost. And then we can add faces. This one I'll give a smiling face. I guess a smiling ghost. And then I put a paper napkin on top of a piece of foam in order to serve them. And I'll just push it into the foam to serve them. So there we have a little dessert item. Uh, it's a little Halloween. We'll be back in a minute when the casserole is finished. We're ready to take our casserole out of the oven. That all goes spread up pretty well. We set this down on the counter with the other items that we've made today. And we have a few extras here. This is a pear and arugula salad that uh, is just pears, arugula, gorgonzola, and wa uh, toasted walnuts, and I'm using a maple vinaigrette on that, which is three tablespoons of olive oil, two tablespoons of white balsamic vinegar, and one tablespoon of maple syrup mixed together. We have our little ghosts, donut hole ghosts, our spooky skeleton eggs, and I've uh, poured some cider into a carafe, and online you can find all sorts of things that you can print off. This says which is full strength witch's brew, and I just uh, used double-sided tape to put that on the front of my carafe to make it a little special. I've made a flower arrangement using three pumpkins that I purchased, and things that I picked from my garden. Uh, pods, big pods from Iris, Artemisia, Sedum Autumn Joy, Golden Rock, and some of the hydrangea, as well as some grasses and other pods and things from the garden. This is a dry arrangement. It'll last a long time. The pumpkins last quite a long time, but not as long as the other items. The other thing I've made are some dog biscuits. After I made the pumpkin donuts, I had some pumpkin left, and these are peanut butter pumpkin dog treats. And they are, I used a pumpkin cutter to cut them, and it's uh, half a cup of pumpkin, a third of a cup of peanut butter, and a cup of whole wheat flour, mixed together, rolled and cut, and then baked until they're fairly hard, and they'll be kind of chewy. And I'm going to give one to my friend. Come on, buddy. Let's get Buddy over here so that we can give him a nice treat. Come on. Come on. Okay. You've been watching A Walk in the Garden with Liz Davy on NCTV. Join me next time as we do some Thanksgiving cooking and see what's going on in the garden.